What are we doing? Sorry about that. Did I already press record? Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's just not enough coffee in the world, really. Okay. So, we ended up and I want to kind of backtrack just a tad talking about hormones. Hormones regulate bone growth, yes? And we're looking at um, about page 187 in your textbook. 186, 187. Growth hormones, actually, the hormones that are going to help maintain your reproductive organs, believe it or not, are also involved in bone growth. So these hormones are important to help bones grow in infancy to adulthood and then continue bone growth and remodeling during adult years. Because we all know that bones never stop growing, correct? Okay, and that's what they talk about under the remodeling part of this whole chapter. So when we finish growing in length and we have an epiphyseal line now, we are still growing our bones. We're constantly building matrix and breaking down. We're constantly creating those little growth rings. What was the name for those growth rings? They're inside osteons. What are the rings? Lamella. Okay. So we're constantly making those and then breaking them down to release calcium into the circulatory system. And again, we see one of these wonderful little um, negative feedback diagrams. Everybody should understand what the hormones do and how they help maintain bone shape. So we should understand bone remodeling, bone deposit, bone reabsorption, and all of that good stuff. Understand what parathyroid hormone does for us with respect to shaping and growing our bones. But another thing that's going to help shape and grow our bones is stress, mechanical stress. And we talked a little bit about this or mentioned it in the last class. But stress on your bones is going to stimulate osteoblasts to produce that osteoid and create that matrix. That force is also going to create areas in bones, in long bones, in all bones, that are thicker than others. And that stress is going to allow those bones to become strong enough to handle the weight in which they support. So when we respond with bone production to mechanical stress, it's going to increase the hardness of bone. Bones are not straight either. When we go into the laboratory, unfortunately, um, because real bones are really expensive, we have some disarticulated skeletons, but they're made of a, a polymer, a plastic material. So sometimes they appear to be straight, but the femur is not a straight bone. This big, long bone is curved. Now, why do you think it's curved? Yeah, it's going to allow to it's going to allow that bone to handle more weight. Also, trabeculean bone, very important. It's very important to house all of the marrow we talked about, but it adds some give to bones as well. Bones also have large bony projections. And remember, we have to learn all of those, right? In this chapter, everybody's pretty excited about that. Um, but those projections are related to where bones articulate. But there are also projections related to mechanical stress. So there's going to be thickening areas or maybe something sticking out because something's pulling on it. Yes? I'm sorry, I backtrack. No, no, that's okay.
Not maintain bone matrix, maintain bone. Creating, yeah. So you don't like that question? No. Okay. That's a good argument. Should I throw it out? Yes. Okay. Deal. <laughs> I can't remember. It was number. Was it, no, I think it was like six or something. Something in. So that's definitely a question I should reword. Now that you want me to throw it out, tell me how I should word it. That doesn't that doesn't say anything about Good point. Question thrown out. Thank you. Also classmates, thank your classmates. I will do that because I am not perfect. Because sometimes when I write a question, I know what I mean. But then when you guys go to answer the question, you say, what the heck did she... So you give me insight as to maybe I need to reword that question. So don't ever be afraid to... Huh? No, no, no. No, sir. Your arm is going to break. Go ahead. Yeah. But I can understand the argument of, I can understand the confusion. And maybe if I want to arrive at that, then I'll come at it a different way. Yes? But that will disappear. So you're whatever, you're going to have only, you're going to have, um, it doesn't disappear and lower your points you're still going to get the points. So you're basically going to get points. No, I'm not going to give, because you got another one wrong, I'm not going to give you free points. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't be greedy. Can you tell us what I don't remember. Don't worry about it. Because I based two of those problems. The one, so if I got that one wrong, the next one I answered, was the one that I answered wrong? Yeah, but you should you should answer your questions based on the question, not the answer before. So don't we'll we'll argue it later if you want to argue some more. All right, so mechanical stress then is also going to stimulate all of those guys that we learned about, and that point of stress tends to be thicker in bones, especially long bones. Uh, they talk a little bit about something called Wolf's Law. I won't get crazy about that, but these are all physics kind of things that relate to the structure of your skeleton. So vigorous exercise, pulling, muscle, tendon, bone, yes? So when you move your muscles a lot, you're going to strengthen your bones. You're going to make them thicker. Yes? So if you have problems with your bones, and, and sometimes we see this when we start to age, and we'll talk about the end of this chapter, when we start to break down bone faster than we build bone, what's one of the ways that you can ensure that you continue to strengthen your skeleton as you age? Move. So look at the difference between this tennis player's serving arm and her other arm. And this is what? What are you looking at? You're looking at the, the amount of compact bone in a long bone. Now remember, your long bone, the diaphysis, is mostly compact bone, right? So if I continue to pull on it, what am I going to do? 
create much more of it than we see in the non-serving arm of this particular athlete. No, it just has less compact bone. It's just showing you that there's more compact bone in the diaphysis of an arm that works more. That's her. That's the one she's. That's just the extra above and beyond this. This it's the same, pretty much same diameter all the way around, but we see there's more compact bone in an arm that works harder than there is in an arm that doesn't work as hard. Yes? So you're going to make more. All right, the other thing we need to know, oh, look, there's steps. What an opportunity for an essay question is when we break bone, because it's a living tissue, what can we do? We can repair it and regenerate it. So they, these are the steps to repairing bones when they break or fracture. So when you break a bone because it's loaded with blood vessels, you're going to break apart some of those blood vessels. And what's going to happen? Hematoma. hematoma. What's a hematoma? Yeah, it's like a big buildup of blood. That's what a bruise is. You break blood vessels and it builds up under the skin. Why does it look blue? Yeah, why do you, that's why when you look at your arms, you see your veins, the little surface veins, they look blue, right? It's because of the pigments that reflect through your skin. Your vein, the blood is not blue. Some of you think you have blue blood, but you do not. The blood in your veins is a little bit different colored. It's actually more in color, looks like the, the color of the chairs in this, lab, in this uh, lecture hall. Oxygenated blood is much brighter red when it's carrying hemoglobin. When it's carrying carbon dioxide, it's darker. <coughs> so hematoma forms. Now we have to go and repair the bone. What does bone come from? Cartilage. So we start to build with very similar cells we see in the matrix of our cartilage. We start to build something called a fibrocartilaginous callus kind of like a scab. We're also going to start to knit more of those blood vessels. So is the uh, fibro, what would you just call it? Fibro cartilage. Okay. Now is that one like, uh, I broke bones before and had to have like uh, bone spurs taken off. Is that what causes those? Some, Sometimes, and the question was, you break a bone, sometimes you have bone spurs. When you break a bone, you have to make sure that you line it back up so all of this can happen and your bone's going to be similar to what it was before. Sometimes when you break a bone, little chips fall off the bone and they end up getting caught up in places they shouldn't be caught up. If your bones aren't lined up and they heal, they're going to... That's the way they're going to be. So when you go to the doctors, if you break a bone, sometimes if you break it unevenly, what do they have to do? They have to set it. They have to break it. Or if you've already started healing, they might have to re-break it to set it up straight. And that's what casting does. It helps to keep everything straight. So those bone spurs might be little chips of however you broke your bone that ended up in places they shouldn't be. No. No, it's usually caused from bone chipping and ending up in places that it doesn't belong. No, but how does it become solid in that spot? Like they're not loose. It might get caught it might get caught up in this whole healing process. So healing begins step two. We make cartilage and then we're eventually going to turn it into bone, just like we saw when we talked about the ossification processes earlier. Third, that callus is then going to form bone. The bone, again, when we started beginning bone, first we made trabeculae, and then we filled in the spaces to make that compact bone where we see this fracture happening. And then we remodel, shape it, so it looks similar to what it was originally. 
But when you break bone, just like when you have a scar, just like when you sewed your socks, we talked about this, didn't we? Yeah, it's stronger in that place. There's more fibroblasts in that area that had to create all of this knitting back. So when I look at x-rays, I can see little thicker areas in places where people have gone through this process. Are they fibroblasts or are they osteoblasts? Well, they're going to be osteo eventually, but remember when we had to create the cartilage. The Correct. Correct but you have more cells in that area. Just like you had more fibroblasts in, in your connective tissue, you have more osteo or osteoid material in that area now. Yes? The precursor cells uh, that differentiate into fibroblasts, are those mesenchymal? In the intramembranous ossification. Precursor cells are osteoprogenitor cells as we mature our bone. depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about cells that are making cartilage, they're going to be fibroblasts. So they're fibroblasts in the fibrocartilaginous stage. Then we have more osteoid or osteoprogenitor and bone cells once we get the remodeling phase going. Okay? You have to know <coughs> All the different fractures on page 190, table 6.2. So, you should be able to describe comminuted and compression and spiral and epiphyseal. And usually this one tends to um, occur in either younger or people that are having way too much bone decalcification happening. Depressed or green stick. Again, green stick is one of those things we see in younger bones also. Try to break a green stick off of a tree. Try to break it in half. It kind of splinters. It doesn't break clearly. Um, they also talk about homeostatic imbalances. You should know the definitions of all the homeostatic imbalances outlined in your book. Osteomalacia, bad bones, or malformed bones. Rickets. What's rickets? Problems with young children, bone formation, which is happening at a very fast rate in young children. <laughs> Decrease in the important building blocks to form those bones. Vitamin D deficiency. Why does vitamin D have anything to do with anything? Yeah, it helps calcium absorption through the digestive system and it's going to help build bone matrix. Osteoporosis. And this is normal bone versus osteoporotic bones. What does it look like? Yeah, see all the holes? Holy bones, much weaker. Is this going to hold as much weight? No. Sometimes in severe cases of osteoporosis, somebody can break their hip just walking down the street because it just gives. Um, mention some of the risk factors for osteoporosis. Again, any deficiency in any building block that makes those bones is a problem. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's in the same category. Different reasons, but in the same category. Brittle bone disease was the question. So, um, hormones, remember those hormones we talked about earlier? Well, imbalances in those hormones can also mess up your skeletal system as well. And some women start to experience this when their reproductive system maintaining hormones start to go a little wacky during menopause. So when we start decreasing production of some of those hormones, we start to see um, increased incidence of osteoporosis at those ages. Um, Paget's disease. What's that? It's also an osteomalacia. 
So what we're going to see is bone deposits and reabsorption rates are going to be confused in the skeletal system. Developmental aspects, we're not going to talk about that too much. And typically that's what we're going to skip at the end of most chapters. But what is wrong with this child? First of all, you see through, no, no. 12 weeks, by the way. This is fetus, 12 weeks old. Why does it look like there's all these spaces in between the bones? Exactly, all oh, that's cartilage. You can see it quite distinctly in this little x-ray. The other thing you can see is those centers that are madly producing bone. There's big ones down here in the ilium, at the ends of those bones. You can see one nice right there, those centers where bone produce, production is kicked up. So know your bone markings. Know your fractures. And we're not going to do that because we're going to do chapter 7. You want one question? All right. Uh, all right, which of the following is not a type of cartilage? Remember, click so I know you're here, because it's kind of like your attendance, right? Well, you took a quiz today, so it's not a big deal, but... What? It doesn't go up. Did you know that? She wants to make sure she's here. She wants to make sure... Oh, you know what? I have two numbers that aren't jiving either. Is somebody getting marked absent all the time that's not absent? You don't check? Go check. 50, is that our number? 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What's the answer? The answer is D. Oh, sugar. Wait, so let's go back. Ooh, nice. Let's do one more. What the heck? Fibrocartilage would be found in which location? The hockey pucks. The hockey pucks. That's your hint. Five, four, three, two, come on, click. Two more clickers. All right. What's the answer? B, the knee. What in the knee is fibrocartilage? Meniscus. All right, elastic cartilage in your floppy ears, not fibrocartilage. <laughs> That's because you have little ears. I have big, giant, like, dumbo ears. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's mine. Okay, so... Any questions on Chapter 6? Okay, so here's what I do. Some instructors don't even bother covering this chapter, but I like to get my exercise. So, what I'm going to show you from this chapter is basically the 206 bones that you have to know. You have to know them for your lab, yes? So I'm going to point out where they are and give you some little hints to hopefully jog your memory when it comes to taking your exam. 
questions on your lecture exam will be worded like this bone is in the upper arm, you know, this one is in the lower leg, lateral. The, you need to know your anatomic terms and you should be able to know which bones lie in the places that I ask you they do. Okay? Remember, we have two distinct portions of the skeleton. That blue stuff, what do we call that? Axial. I cram the rod down the top of your head, through the spinal cord, everything that hangs out, axial. Everybody else is appendicular. You'll see that again. It's going to be on your lab exam. So 206 bones about support, protection, 20% of body mass, bones. First thing you talk about is the skull. That's your football helmet. Yes? That's the football helmet, not this. What's this? They call these facial bones. So, who do we have football helmet? Very tightly stuck together. So when we look at the bones, they're not going to freely move. Are they? No. no. They're going to hook together so we don't get a lot of movement. And places called sutures. And somebody was kind enough to smash the only wonderful skull that I have in the lab. Yeah, I was so mad. But the nice thing is when you go into the lab and we start looking at bones, you can actually see how those sutures fit into each other, how that bone grows. Are you born like that? No. No. What's there? Fontanelles. Yeah, membranes. They're called fontanelles. And you look at a newborn baby and it's kind of like alien because it looks like it's got a heartbeat up there. Okay, that, the reason for that is A, your head's going to get bigger after you're born, and B, you have to be born. Right, yeah, exactly. So babies that start to form their sutures too early can die during childbirth because their head doesn't, and I, I hate to make this sound terrible, but as you squish through the birth canal, yeah, you squish those bones closer, and sometimes they actually even overlap at those fontanelles. So it's quite the trauma, the whole childbirth thing. And some naturally born children look like cone heads when they come out, because that's exactly what happens. So, the skull. How many bones in the skull? Well, put your hand like this. I do that a lot when I correct your exams. <laughs> Frontal bone. Hands over here. Parietal bones. Back here. Occipital bone. Stick your fingers in your ears. Oh, you know, yeah, if you didn't clean or anything. Temporal bones. There's a space that leads to your inner ear in the temporal bone. Okay? So, when you learn your bones, I highly suggest you do not learn them from this book. Why? Because of the pretty colors. Bones do not have pretty colors. And when you sit down for your lab practical exam, the bones will not be pretty colored. They will be bone colored. So what should you use to memorize your bones? The atlas that came with your book. Much better study tool. Because some people just will, will focus so hard on the colors that they don't really see the bone. Yeah, your PAL program is going to be helpful too. So we see them here, frontal. These guys are facial bones. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Now what's in here? That's where your eyeballs are. Those are called your orbitals. And they're actually formed by many different bones. See, this, 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 your football helmet is not one bone. Your skull is not one bone. It's many bones that during the process of development fuse together. So the orbit of the eye is actually made of many bones. Ah, what are they? So let's, let's go find them. First of all, you have your frontal bone. 
Then you have this one here. That's part of no, no nasal bone. It's part of your cheek. In the front here. What's this? Maxilla. Here. Cheek. Zygomatic. Now you've got some in the back. So if I cut your skull off at the top and look inside, I see some bones at the base of the skull too. So these aren't just the only ones. We have some at the base. This one here is called the ethmoid bone. And it's got a bunch of holes in it and it's behind the bridge of your nose. It forms or helps to form the base of the skull. And it's going to help me resonate. That's why I talk so loud. And it's going to help with the whole breathing process. When the spaces in that bone get all filled up, what happens to you? You start to talk funny. Yes? Because your nose is your nose is stuffy. Those spaces get full and you can't resonate as well. So they're going to help with resonation and all of that other stuff that's going on behind the nose. We'll talk about when we talk about the respiratory system. This red one here, it actually sticks out the side right near the temporal bone. The pink one, it's called the sphenoid bone. And if I look at it, at the base of the skull, it's one bone that kind of spans the base of the skull and sticks out on either end. See it here and here? It looks like a bat. So we'll look at it. We'll look at a picture of it in a minute. And then run your tongue across the top of your, the roof of your mouth. Most of it is actually this bone. And this bone is called the maxilla. But at the very end, you get a little bump. And past the bump, you probably can't feel it. But there's a little bone that kind of looks like a horseshoe. And it's at the back of your maxilla. And it actually goes up into the orbits of your eyes. And where is it? Why is it not on this picture? Because it, yeah, it's called the palatine bone. Yeah, it's on a, it's on a later, and I'll, I'll point it out. So that's also part. So the nasal bone is not part of the orbit of the eye because, see, this other little green bone blocks it off. And what is it? This is called the lacrimal bone. And there's a hole in the lacrimal bone where your tears pour out. Guess what they call that gland that makes tears? The lacrimal gland. So many of these bones, and you'll see muscles when we hit that, are named for other things. And that's one of them. The only movable portion of your skull and facial bones is the mandible at the bottom. Blood vessels and nerves. Remember, nerve innervation moves muscles. We, and all bone needs blood. So we see foramina in many different places in bone. And that's what I want you to notice in lab. There's holes in bone. That's where the nerve goes. The holes are for either nerve groups or blood vessels or both. And some of them are very prominent. You're lucky because in a really intense anatomy and physiology class, not only do you have to learn the 206 bones, but you have to learn all of the bone markings, including the major foramina. We're going to give you a list of the ones we think are important for you to know. OK? What are these things? What are they made of? Bone, but they're not included in your skeleton. They're covered with an extra covering called enamel. And they sit in the top and bottom of your jaw, maxilla, and mandible. So the skull is very, very complex. Where bones meet, we form sutures, or interwoven areas where the bones meet so they don't move a lot. Are you going to have to know your sutures? Yes. Sagittal, the one where the occipital and the parietal bones meet, what do we call that? It's called lambdoid. One of the processes off of the bone back here it's called the mastoid process. This is actually part of the temporal bone. 
And then we see names of different bone markings in these diagrams. Protuberance on the occipital bone. What's that? What's the, what is the external occipital protuberance created by? Ready? What, just, what did I just do? So there's muscles attached here, correct? And when I shorten them, I pull on the back of my skull. Yes? That's what those are caused by. <coughs> Side view, we can see that temporal bone a little bit better. See how complex it is? Kind of looks like a dinosaur almost. It's got things hanging off of it. It's got big holes in it. And it's got projections coming off of it. This process or projection meets this bone here to form your cheekbones. And there's muscles that run behind that space that allow you to do this. Yes? So that's why this moves. They're attached here and here. If you do that, you can actually feel it up here. Yes? So sometimes when we go, oh, my temples hurt, it's like, well, it's kind of not really the temples. You'd have to stick your finger in your ear if you were talking about temples, right, or temporal bone. So this process is named for the bone in which it meets. So this is called the zygomatic process on the temporal bone. Guess what this thing sticking out on the zygomatic bone is called? This process is called the temporal process. Exactly. So a lot of the naming makes sense once you learn the name of the bones. That's what it should look like when you study it. OK? And you can see all the holes in bones. This is a real skull. <laughs> it's got cavities and really bad teeth. When I open up inside, I see that some of those bones, especially at the base of the skull, have big spaces in them. This, that pink bone that looks like a bat, is called the sphenoid bone. And there's sinuses in there as well. At the base of the skull, when we flip it over, tons of holes. You got a bunch of holes in your head. For what? What's up here that's kind of important in your football cap? Your central nervous system, right? And in order to communicate with the rest of your body, we have to have some way to connect to the central nervous system. And a lot of that connection happens at the base. What's this? Big hole. What's it called? It's called the foramen hole magnum. Big hole. Yes? What is it? A hole for who? spinal cord to feed all of that information up to the brain for processing and then bring all of that information down to cause some sort of result. So all of these other very large holes, which all have names, may house not only nerves, but they also might house what? Blood vessels. What's the jugular? One of the major blood vessels that feeds the head. Yes? So they're named for what's in them, what passes through them, what's beside them. So we'll have you um, know, again, we'll give you a list of the ones we want you to know. What's this? That's the palatine bone. Okay? So that was the one I was talking about earlier. And the bump is right about there. What's that hole up there? It's called the incisive fossa. That used to be two bones when you were developing in mom. And it fuses together to form what we call your palate. Anybody ever hear of something called cleft palate? What is it? It's when that doesn't come together the way it should and leaves a big space. What's above that? <coughs> yeah, all of your nasal workings. 
and nasal passages. So that can be a big problem if things get up into your nasal passages. They might get down into your lungs. So cleft palate could be an issue, especially when baby starts to eat, which would, should probably start happening quite soon after they're born, correct? So that, that's why that's a problem for aspiration and, and just eating in general can be a problem. So that is the base of the skull. When we open it up, now we get a better view of that bat, the sphenoid bone at the base. And again, each of the parts of that sphenoid bone are named lesser wing, greater wing. Superior is on the top, anterior is front, inferior, bottom. No. I'm not looking. I'm looking from the top. Superior. Right. Yeah. Down to the bottom. No, no, no. I'm looking from superior. Do you understand? This is a superior view. So find superior, stand there, and look in. Don't think about where you're looking to. Think about where you're looking from. Does that make sense? Okay, so temporal bone, really weird shape. This is it all by itself. Remember, it's got a nice big process sticking out. And any, any of you women wear those big, way too tall, spiky heels? What do they call them? Stilettos. Well, this has its own little stiletto or styloid process sticking out the bottom. Again, these processes are either meeting other bones or they have muscles hooked to them for movement purposes. We have a big hole called the external acoustic meatus. And what does that lead to? The inner ear. So you can hear stuff. <clears throat> so that's the temporal bone. There's my sphenoid bone. Doesn't that look like a bat? Actually, I think if I look at the posterior view of this, it's a flying cow. I don't know. That's what I see. It looks like a flying cow. See, this is the cow's face. I don't know. That's what I see. Yeah. See the ears? Okay, so that is the base of the skull sphenoid bone. Remember, it sticks out on either end, so we see it when we look at the outside of the football cap. That's my ethmoid bone. That's the one behind the nasal bone. That's the one with all the holes in it. And again, that's going to serve a purpose for the respiratory system, helping to bounce air around when we breathe it in. A bunch of holes so I can resonate, or sinuses. We see the maxilla and the mandible. The mandible is the moving part at the bottom. The maxilla is this part. Both of them are going to house teeth. I want to talk about joints in Chapter 8, and the teeth are stuck into something called the gomphosis. So this shows the orbit of the eye. And this is always going to be a nice what? Bonus question, a say question, I don't know. I like to always throw it in. So the bones that make up the orbit of the eye again are the frontal bone, the lacrimal bone. What's this one? That's the ethmoid bone, a little piece of it. What's the pink one? The sphenoid bone. Who's this? Zygomatic bone. Who's this? Maxilla. So see, it runs all the way up here and hits the bottom of your eyes. Nasal bone? No. The nasal bone is not part of the orbit of the eye. And then here's that tiny, tiny little piece of the roof of your mouth the palatine bone, okay? And that's what it actually looks like in a real skull. When we open up the sideway view of the 
Nasal cavity, excuse me, we see another bone that sort of separates and helps to form something called the nasal septum. Most of the septum is actually cartilage, but the base is bone. And that green one over there is called what? Inferior nasal concha. And there's also another one called the vomer. And that's going to help create the nasal septum. Because you have two nostrils, air coming in, right? The reason for that is because we want to bounce air around. The more we bounce it around, the faster the molecules move. The faster the molecules move, the what? To the temperature. Yeah, it, it increases temperature. Why do I want to increase the temperature of air when I breathe it in? Yeah, you want to get it as close to body temperature as you can and ready that amount of time. Yes? Better exchange of respiratory gases. This is a nice diagram because it shows you where all of those spaces are. So they're not just behind the nose. There's some in the maxilla. There's some in the ethmoid, that one right behind this nasal bone. There's some in the sphenoid at the base of the skull. And there's some in the frontal bones. In the bone? Yep. Spaces inside the bone. Now, anybody ever get a really bad sinus infection? And your whole face aches, and sometimes it gets so bad your teeth hurt? You know why now? Because sinuses, spaces, become filled with fluid too much instead of the little that they're supposed to have, and they're going to start causing pressure and pain. So sometimes your teeth can ache, especially if your maxillary sinuses are full. Wow. Wow. Ouch. No, I have a disgusting tick story I'll tell you sometime. Um, hyoid bone. Kind of looks like, um, that does kind of look like a flying cow now, doesn't it? Or a flying something. That's one that kind of hangs out. Now, it hangs out, you ready? It's not this. What's this thick area in your neck? That's not even a bone. That's your larynx, the top part of your trachea. It's actually cartilage. This is here. You can't feel it. It's way under here. It's called the hyoid bone, and it's, your tongue muscles are wrapped on it. Can you swallow your tongue? You can bite a chunk off and swallow that. But you cannot swallow your tongue because it's all wrapped quite tightly in, in place. And the hyoid bone is going to help with that. So again, wonderful book, tables, pretty colors. There's the bones. There's where they live. That's the skull. Next, what's this? We're still in what part of the skeleton? The axial skeleton. This is your spinal cord. How many bones in the spinal cord? Lots. You ready? You've got a whole bunch of little bones. Kind of look like hockey pups with something sticking off the back. The reason for that, protection for your spinal cord. And it allows places for nerves to come in and out. There's a whole bunch of holes in the spinal cord, and there's also big spaces between the bones. That's going to allow for movement. Is your spinal cord straight up and down? No. no. Just like with bones, straight up and down doesn't work for pressure, right? So there's curves in your spinal cord. They're named for the vertebrae, the single bones that they're in and around. So you have seven separate bones in your neck called your cervical vertebrae. You have 12 of these guys in your chest area or thoracic region called your thoracic vertebrae. You have five of them in your very lower back, the longest and strongest of the, all of the vertebrae called the lumbar vertebrae. And then you have this little cup-shaped bone that actually used to be five bones until they all fused together to form the sacrum. 
And then you got some little bones hanging off the end that used to actually be four bones called the coccyx. Now, some people speculate that's the remnants of your tail. Because some people speculate you used to have a tail before you turned into you. What? Evolution thing. Yes? So the curves are named, and it, what kind of curve is it? It forms a letter. S-shaped curve. That's normal. Anything that frays to the sides laterally or we don't have those curves, that can be a problem. It can be a problem with nerves that feed into those areas. It can cause a lot of pain. It can cause numbness. It can cause mobility to be disrupted. So those curves are important. That S-shaped curve is extremely important in the spinal cord. Each of those vertebrae, you're going to have to be able to distinguish. And these are some people who are having problems. This one's having problems because that giant baby is being formed and pulls on the lower and cause lordosis. Kyphosis, hunchback, scoliosis, we have problems laterally. Again, that can cause problems with a whole bunch of different things depending on what's being pressed on. So, very little movement here, but movement. It allows me to bend over, yes? I have a question. Yep. It depends on the, on the severity of the scoliosis. Okay, if it's very severe, they can do things to straighten things out. But again, you don't want to straighten that up and down either. So it depends on the severity of the, of the, the curve. This, those discs that hang out between, yes, you had a question, hon? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. There's a curve to the rod. And again, depending on the on the severity of the curve, there's gonna be different lengths and different ways that they help straighten out that spine. As close as you can get with a with a rod, but it's still not perfect. Yeah. Okay, the discs, fibro cartilage, intervertebral discs between the vertebrae. Remember, I was talking about hockey pucks before. Well, this is the view of one of those hockey pucks. And in between this very strong fibrocartilage that surrounds it, we have it a little bit more gelatinous here. That's called the pulposis. And if I squish down really, really hard on that and squish it out the side, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, it's called a herniated disc. And see what the problem is with this particular one? What's it doing? It's pushing on this nerve group that's feeding the spinal cord. That can cause all sorts of problems, especially pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all the vertebrae have the same basic design except for a couple at the top. They have a body where the next one sits on top of it. That's the one that kind of looks like a hockey puck. And then they have processes of projections and a big hole, vertebral what? For Raymond, what's coming through the big hole? Spinal cord. Processes are either articulating with the bone above it or have some sort of muscle hanging on to it to cause movement. The cervical vertebrae are the exception to all the rest of the vertebrae's rule. The first cervical vertebrae, C1, is called the atlas. Who's atlas in? He's the one that holds up the world. Your atlas holds up your big head. Yes? The world spins on a what? 
axis, your second cervical vertebrae, is called the axis because your head pivots on it. See this little thing that sticks up here? It's a little bone that projects up into this region. That is called the dens. And that's why you can do this. So C1, atlas. C2, axis. So in between that little space there, there has to be uh, uh, what you could just call it, fiber, uh, fibrocartilage. Bones articulating with bones, rubbing over and against. What kind of cartilage? Highland cartilage. So see all these little little pads where the next bone sits? Highland cartilage. Between each of the bodies, what kind of cartilage? Fibrocartilage. On the top of the dens, what is the cartilage that's in between there? Is the highland On top of the dens, there is no cartilage because the bone on bone. No. It's coming through this space right here. This cartilage allows it to move right here. So this is a facet for the dens on C1, highland cartilage, on this bone, not on that one. Yes? So it's going to rub against some nice, slick, slippery surface in the bone above. Oh. I gotta go back. When you go to distinguish the difference between cervical and all the other vertebrae, the other thing cervical vertebrae have that the others don't is this. Two holes on the either side. They're called transverse holes or foramen. And what do you think's running up in those holes? Yeah, some major blood vessels that are gonna feed the central nervous system brain. The other thing is the thing that sticks out the back of these vertebrae, called the spinous process. <coughs> process of the spine. What's hanging off of those? Muscles. Yeah, muscles. So you can move all of these guys, right? So the spinous process of the three different types of vertebrae are also going to be a distinguishing factor. <laughs> the cervical vertebrae are very small spinous processes. And they are what we call bifed. They look like a forked tongue. The spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae are pointing down this, in this direction. They also have superior articular facets that are sticking up like this, that articulate with the bone above them. Yes? And then they have transverse facets that kind of look like little ears like this. Those are giraffes, thoracic giraffes. We're going to go down to the lumbar, and things are going to change up a little bit. You still have the same parts, but they look a little bit different. We see the transverse processes sticking out this way instead of coming in on us. The superior articular facets don't face this way anymore. They face this way. That spinous process sticking out the back is no longer pointing down. It's pointing out, and it's thicker. It's a moose, the lumbar moose. So the strongest, biggest. But don't judge by size when you look at bones. Because the last thoracic vertebrae and the first lumbar vertebrae are pretty much the same size, correct? So you have to look at all the other distinguishing factors to help you distinguish the difference between those bones. You'll do this in lab, so don't panic. So those are all the little vertebrae. At the base, we have the sacrum, big holes in the sacrum, why? A bunch of nerve groups coming that help to innervate and get messages from your lower limbs are going to feed into those bones into the base of the spinal cord. And then the little coccyx at the bottom. Thoracic cavity. We're still on the what skeleton? 
Axio, made up of how many ribs? I'll give you a hint. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae and two ribs articulate with each of them. How many ribs do you have? 24. 24 ribs? Yes, everyone has 24 ribs, males and females both. Nobody's missing any. Your ribs articulate, for the most part, with your sternum in the front to create thoracic cavity. And your ribs start way, way up here. So one through seven ribs articulate pretty directly with the sternum via cartilage. It's called costal cartilage. The cartilage is there to allow expansion and constriction of the thoracic cavity so you can what? So you can breathe. The other guys are sort of indirectly articulating with the sternum. They're called false ribs. And the two down at the bottom don't even articulate with the sternum. They're just kind of floating around there. They call them floating ribs. So one through seven, true ribs. The rest, false ribs. And two of those false ribs are also called floating ribs. Clavicles. Anybody ever break their collarbone? Yeah. That's going to help hold that arm on with another very important bone in the back called the what? Scapula. The back of the scapula, this is what? Posterior aspect. There's a spine sticking out. You can actually feel it sometimes. That is what it is. The portion looking this way, that's anterior, is this view. <clears throat> and we create a nice little ball for our a nice little socket, I should say, for our ball to fit in, which is the upper arm. Longest, strongest, humerus. This hole is on the back of the humerus. This is posterior. It's called the olecranon fossa. And guess what hooks into it? The olecranon process that sticks out of the what? It's called the ulna. It's the reason you can only go that far. Radius, ulna. Two lower bones in the, two bones in the lower arm. Radius is called the radius because guess what? One of the joints is round at the top. And then the ulna has this little scoop. Or spoon that fits into what? Yeah, the humerus. Yes. Phalanges. Lots of bones. You have some in the wrist. Those are called your carpals. How many carpals do you have? Eight. Then you have bones that form the palm of your hand. They're called meta in the middle carpals. Then you have your digits that are made up of three bones, except for thumbs, two phalanges. So how many phalanges do you have? Huh. Four. No. Three, six, nine, twelve. Fourteen. See, each of your fingers is made up of three phalange bones except for the thumbs that have two. Your feet are the same way, except you don't have eight bones. You have seven, because the heel kind of takes up two bone spaces. That's how I remember. So know the arm and all those bones. Know the wrist and the hand. Hips. Actually, this big, huge bone, sometimes referred to as the coxal bone, is made of three bones. The ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Yes. And the pubis comes in the front, and you sit on your ischium. This you feel up here, that's your ilium, your iliac crest. All right. So that's chapter seven. I'll finish up 
um, my little speech, and we will see you when? Thursday. Thursday. So you need to study really hard. Even though you have a break, you need to study.